I'm sorry to interrupt, but anybody can hear anything? Uh, I have no sound. Me too. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, so the main theme is complex structures that maintain their integrity in the presence of random fluctuations. And there, there are various facets of uh, this kind of thing. So there is uh, the statistical mechanics of uh, quasi crystals, and then there is uh, the story of building nano structures using. Um, uh, DNA self-assembly, and then there are connections with uh, fault-tolerant tol computation and um, other things as well. But uh, so today I will mostly focus on statistical mechanics of uh, quasi-crystals. Uh, okay, so but let's start with crystals. So crystals are things that I don't consider as complex structures, but nevertheless it's good to start with them so that we get a better feeling. So, and still these crystals, they have, a, um, there are open problems about them in statistical mechanics. So main problem is, uh, why is it that when we lower the temperature, most materials turn into crystals? So they take the crystalline form. And by crystal, I mean this uh, highly ordered periodic structure. And, um, so the way to think about it, in, well, the, the way that people in statistical mechanics think about it is that, so if, we, if you look at every pair of atoms in that uh, crystal structure, there is some potential energy between them. And that potential energy depends on the distance between them. And if the, the, they are very far from each other, or farther than a certain amount, then there is essentially no interaction between them. And if they are, very close to each other, they want to repel each other. And then, uh, so this is modeled by the energy uh, associated to each pair of uh, atoms. And uh, so there's repellence at a very uh, short range and there's no interactions at the far uh, in, um, at distance uh, between particles which are very far from each other. And then there is some uh, optimal distance, which is which minimizes the energy. So this is here on the right. I have the yes, just a typical uh, graph of a graph of a typical interaction energy between two atoms. Now, if we have uh, a large number of atoms that are put together. At zero, zero temperature, zero Kelvin, uh, there is essentially no uh, kinetic energy. And the atoms try to arrange themselves into a structure which minimizes the potential energy. So now, but, but instead of two atoms, we have many, many, many atoms. And they want to form some structure together uh, which minimizes the potential energy. So this is what we call a ground configuration. Uh, now, at, at positive temperature, uh, there will be some uh, random fluctuations. So there will be some kinetic energy random fluctuations. And those fluctuations cause some localized uh, deviations from the perfect crystalline structure. Nevertheless, uh, for whatever reason that is mysterious, for most materials, this structures, uh, structure will uh, be stable even despite these deviations, it's that the overall structure will be stable. Um, yeah, for example, there will be some deviations like this. So here, for example, there's deviation from uh, the crystalline structure and somewhere else as well. But nevertheless, the overall order, the periodic order uh, survives, meaning that if I know that there is an atom here, then uh, we, I know with uh, high certainty that here there will be also an atom, and so on and so on. Okay, and these two problems are largely un unresolved. 
so there, for crystals at zero temperature, there are some partial results, and in particular in two dimensions uh, for certain types of potentials. Uh, Florian Tile has, has shown that uh, um, there will be, uh, at, at zero temperature, there will be crystalline structure. So the, the, the atoms will, the, the ground configurations which minimize the, uh, the energy uh, have some periodic structure. And, but in three dimension, which is more <laughs> relevant to physics, this is uh, still unresolved, although there are some partial results. In three dimension, this is completely uh, open, except that there is there are some results that some mathematical results that suggest that uh, in two dimensions the crystals would not, are not stable. Okay, so now so this is the statistical mechanics of uh, crystals, but on the other hand, the geometry of these kind of crystalline structures has been studied for many, many years by mathematicians and crystallographers. And a lot has been discovered about them, about the structure of the crystals. And in particular, the symmetry group of these this, uh, crystalline structures has been classified. And so what do I mean by symmetry? I, I just mean, um, so it's a symmetry of a set of points in the plane or in, in the three dimensional space would be some isometry that uh, maps this, this point set into itself. And for example, the translational symmetry would be that so, so crystals have translational symmetries. For example, if I have this crystal, then there are certain directions that if I shift uh, this structure, I get something which is, which coincides with, with the original structure. And uh, so in this particular example, there's, this, uh, there, there's also rotational symmetry. So if I rotate this structure by uh, 60 degrees, then I get another structure which coincides with the original structure. These are, this is the rotational symmetry of the, uh, the arrangement of atoms. Of course, the, the real crystals in, are in three dimensions, but I, I'm depicting them just for simplicity in two dimensions. Um, now, the, the, the collection of all symmetries of a crystal form a group, and uh, by definition, well, we're almost by definition, uh, when we talk about a crystal, we mean the structure of atoms or, or an ar ar arrangement of atoms which is fully periodic. In other words, there will be a lattice of translational symmetries. So, for example, here there are two. So this is a two-dimensional case. But, uh, so there are two uh, independent vectors along which we have translational symmetries. And then any product of these two uh, translations will also be a symmetry. So that means that we have an entire uh, lattice of symmetry, uh, translational symmetries. So in three dimensions, there would be three-dimensional lattice. Now, the, the symmetry groups that include a three-dimensional three -dimensional lattice have been classified completely. And uh, in particular, uh, this well-known thing uh, among uh, crystallographers is that uh, most of rotational symmetries are not consistent with translational symmetries. In particular, if you have, this, if you have an arrangement of atoms or a point set in the three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space, which is uh, which has uh, which is fully periodic, so it, meant, it means that it has three-dimensional lattice as a uh, subgroup of symmetries. Uh, um, then it cannot have, for example, five-fold translation uh, rotational symmetry. So the only rotational symmetries that it can have are uh, two-fold symmetry, three-fold symmetry, four-fold symmetry, and six-fold symmetry rotational symmetries. This is very interesting. But, uh, okay. Now, at some point in 1980s, uh, Schechtman, who was a, who was a crystallographer, uh, 
was studying certain alloy under the uh, electron microscope, in particular the, the diffraction pattern of this particular atom, and noticed that the diffraction pattern, which looked like something like this, this is not for that particular uh, alloy, but a different one, similar one. Notice that that diffraction pattern has five-fold rotational symmetry. Uh, at the same time, it has this uh, uh, very sharp peaks. These are called black peaks that are uh, characteristics of crystals. So if you look at the crystal under electron microscope, the diffraction patterns have these sharp peaks. These are, for, for a long time, uh, crystallographers they find the crystal as having sharp peaks uh, in the diffraction patterns. So we noticed sharp peaks, but at the same time, the, the, the diffraction pattern is uh, has five-fold rotational symmetry. Now, as uh, Sherlock Holmes would tell you, that if uh, you eliminate all the impossibles, whatever remains is, uh, no matter how improbable it should be, what is the truth? Truth. And uh, so that suggests that this particular material, the arrangement of atoms in this particular ma material, uh, is still highly ordered because it has sharp peaks. And at the same time, it, it, is not, it doesn't have trans, uh, translational order. So it's, it doesn't have translational uh, symmetry. So it's non periodic, but still highly ordered. So this is what I call a complex structure for a reason that I am going to tell you in a few minutes. A few minutes. Um, okay, now, uh, now the question is the, the statistical mechanics of quasi-crystals. How, how can it be possible that some non-periodic uh, highly ordered structures emerges from just the local interaction between the atoms? So remember the atoms, uh, they, they interact with each other only at short range. And if you, two atoms are very far from each other, they don't interact essentially. So how is it possible that just a short range local interaction between the atoms gives rise to a non-periodic structure? Uh, so this is the question of quasi-crystals as, as zero temperature. And then uh, the, even a more difficult question is, one problem is that, uh, how come, or I mean, how can we explain the fact that for that part, those particular materials, this structure, this non-periodic, non highly ordered structure survives at positive temperature, where there are, there are random fluctuations that cause deviations from the, the original structure. Okay, now, um, concerning the first question, so how can, uh, non-periodic order emerged from local interactions. So mathematicians knew about such possibility for a long time. And here's an example. So you, this is maybe the most uh, famous example. And uh, so I have two tiles. They are of this form. So they are rainbow tiles. And uh, so there's, there's a certain angle here. So this, this is uh, one fifth of a turn. And this is uh, half this, so one tenth of the uh, turn. So these are, uh, and then at the edges of these, there are some decorations. So there are some arrows. So some of the edges are, have um, one arrow, and some of the edges have two arrows. Now, what we want to do is we want to use copies of these uh, tiles, as many as we want, to tile the entire plane. Okay. So you just imagine that you have your, your bathroom and then you want you have as many as you want copies of these tiles and you want to tile the entire bathroom. No. Except that if you want, you want to tile the entire two-dimensional plane, the infinite plane, so like the infinite bathroom of the universe. And it turns out that if you do that, so you get a very nice uh, order the structures which are not periodic. So you can, you can tile the entire plane, but the structure that you get is not periodic. So the tiling would not be periodic. 
And in fact, in this particular example, there will be there, there is five-fold symmetry. So, or at least there are some tilings that have five-fold symmetry. So this is just a portion of the tiling. So the, the real tiling is uh, it's a tiling of the entire two-dimensional plane. Here's another example. So this was discovered by Richard Hammond, uh, which as far as I know, he was, he is, or he was, was uh, uh, not a professional mathematician, but just a, was playing with this as a hobby. So, so here we have two tiles. They are, they have these forms, so they are F-shaped. And there is certain ratio. So there's, there's uh, for example, this, this length to this length is the golden ratio and so on and so forth. And you see that there are some decorations. Now we want to again use copies of these tiles to tile the entire plane, but in such a way that uh, these decorations match. So they have to match each. When you put them next to each other, they have to match. And uh, we are about to rotate these and we are about to also reflect them. So in principle, there are maybe four of them instead of two. Now, an interesting property of these, these two tiles is that we can combine them to get uh, larger copies of the same tiles, essentially, the larger uh, super tiles, which behave exactly like the original tiles. So for example, here, I can put these two tiles together to get a tile which looks like this tile, and I can uh, combine two copies of these and one copy of that in this form, and this also looks like this. And in fact, the, 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 the decorations are also in such a way that the, uh, the constraints that they put, uh, they imposed are exactly like the original tiles. So these super tiles behave exactly like the original tiles. So now if I repeat this process, so I, I can do the same thing. So I can uh, uh, maybe combine these in the same fashion to make larger and larger, larger super tiles and make larger and larger patterns which are completely or uh, tilings. And eventually in the limit, I get a, a tiling of the entire plane. So I can, I can tile the entire plane with these. On the other hand, you can show that Okay, so this is an example. This is an example of a, such a tiling or a portion of a uh, tiling of an entire plane. But uh, so another property is that uh, no matter what tiling you start with, there is a unique way that you can decompose these tiles, the, the, the tiles into super tiles. For example, uh, here I have a copy of the super tile which represents the in the first tile, the super tiles that corresponds to the smaller tile. And you can, wherever you look, you will be able to recognize exactly where you have which of the super tiles. And that's that, using that you can uh, show rather easily that uh, whatever tiling that you have, it cannot be periodic. Okay, so this is something that you can think about and convince yourself that this property implies that not, none of the tilings can be periodic. Here's another example. This is more uh, combinatorial, it's completely discrete. So we have uh, squares of the same size. So the tiles are just square tiles. And the decorations are just colors at the edges. So each edge has a color. And uh, so this time we don't allow rotations and reflections. They have to be exactly in this direction. And uh, we want to tile again the entire plane. And in the, again, uh, when we put two tiles next to each other, the decoration should match. That means that the colors of the touching um, edges should be the same. Uh, so again, this example is a, is a non is an aperiodic tile set. Uh, so that means that you can tile the entire plane, but uh, none of the valid tilings are periodic. So 
you know, the, the interesting thing about these is that they're, they're completely discrete. So you can just, well, they automatically impose a lattice structure. So we can just think about them as assignments of paths to integer lattice points. So instead of having a pro um, problem in uh, two dimensional Euclidean plane, I have, I have a problem about uh, arrangement of paths in the, on the lattice. So it would be completely discrete. Now, there are many, many examples of this form that people have dis dis discovered over the years. So the earliest one is by Berger from 1966, and I will talk about it in a moment a further. And uh, there are various different examples of different uh, levels of generality. Some of them are ge really general constructions of this kind of tile sets. And this is a really active uh, research area. Now, back to the question of, well, not the question, the, the, the claim that, I, well, the thing that I mentioned that aperiodicity has something to do with complexity. So I want to give you some evidence. And why do I say that complexity really is where we have non-periodicity? So one thing is that many of these uh, a periodic tiles that people have discovered, they have a self-similar structure like the one that I sh showed you, so the uh, Ammons tiles uh, class. And uh, so either, but this can be either implicit or explicit. Um, and in fact, so, so this kind of, so you, you can think of this as a substitution. So whenever I have uh, such a pattern, I can substitute it with these two. And whenever I have this pattern, I can substitute with these two. And if I repeat this substitution, so that means that, for example, here, again, I, I replace this with these two and replace this with rotated version of this and so, so on and so forth. This would be one way to, uh, if I repeat this substitution over and over, I get the tiling of the entire plane. And uh, now, uh, it turns out that if you, the, the general, for a general, uh, general class of substitutions, which I am not defining here, but you can imagine, you can, you can construct tile sets that enforce those substitutions. So essentially any substitution can be enforced by uh, local constraints in, in this fashion. So the other, uh, reason behind the, what I said about complexity is that is the connection with computability. Now consider this problem. This is a very natural problem. So let's say I give you a collection of tiles. These this, uh, discrete tiles, these are called bank tiles. Uh, so let's say I have, uh, I'm giving you a collection of bank tiles, a finite number of bank tiles. And I ask you, can you, use copies of this uh, to tile the entire plane, okay? This is a valid question. And uh, now how Wang, who, who was a logician, is wondering whether there's a general method to answer this question, in particular, whether there's an algorithm. Because it, well, the, the tile set is very discrete, so I can, you can give it to a computer, uh, you can give it, have a, nice description of it and give it to a computer. So you can imagine in principle that there would be an algorithm that solves this problem. So whenever you give it a uh, collection of bank tiles, it tells you whether it is possible to tile the entire plane or not. And uh, yeah, so how one ask whether there's such an, such an algorithm. And he observed that there is a connection between this problem as, and a periodicity. And in particular, if, uh, so whether there is such an algorithm or not has to do with whether there exists some tile sets for which we can tile the entire plane, but not in a periodic way. And this led to the discovery of the first uh, aperiodic uh, tile set. So Berger who was a student of Wang, was working on this and discovered that uh, there is indeed, uh, there are indeed some 
um, collection of Wang tiles, which are aperiodic, that they can they can cover the entire plane, but not in a periodic way. And then uh, and, uh, use this construction to show that, in fact, this the algorithmic problem is undecidable. That means that there is no way to construct an algorithm that um, answers this question for all possible inputs. And it turns out that many other properties of Wang tiles are again undecidable. There is no algorithm to solve them. For example, if we are given uh, a set of Wang tiles and we ask, uh, assuming that there is, there is, you can tile the plane, is it true that uh, there exists a periodic tiling? Or is it true that all the tilings are periodic? These are all undecidable and many, many other uh, questions. And the key idea here is that, uh, well, this is the idea that was discovered by Berger and then developed further by other people, is that you can somehow simulate Turing machines with, with bank tiles. Uh, and then the, you can use the hierarchical structure of uh, an aperiodic tile set to ensure that the, the uh, valid tilings correspond to valid trajectories of the Turing machine. And then the undecidability results you follow from the undecidability results concerning Turing machine. For example, the fact that there is no algorithm that tells you whether a given Turing machine halts on a given, let's say, without any inputs. And uh, yeah, so this kind of computational universality, that the, the, the fact that you can embed Turing machines in, the, in these uh, structures is, uh, to me, is a central characteristic of complexity. Because you, it says that essentially you can have, as we can have patterns, impose patterns which are as complex as you want. Okay, so the, this, the theory of this uh, aperiodic classes has many different uh, aspects. And so there is combinatorics, there is analysis, there is geomet geometry for the, for the symmetries, there is symbolic dynamics, there is regalic theory, and uh, there is probability. But uh, remember that I was, well, I started with the problem of uh, statistical mechanics. So let's go back to the, uh, problem of statistical mechanics of quality crystals. So again, the question of how can a non-periodic uh, order to structure arise from uh, local constraints, local interactions. So that, in principle, in a periodic tile set, gives you a, a toy, mo toy model for that, that, because you have just local interactions between the tiles, and then these together, they somehow conspire to form an uh, ordered but non-periodic structure. Uh, now the question is, so, so but if, when you want to go to positive temperatures, so then there will be some random fluctuations, that would be more complicated. And the, now the question is, can we find some toy model which, uh, of this phenomenon that, that, that somehow at positive temperature still the structure survives. The non-periodic structure survives. Now, again, so you may say that, okay, so that even the, the simpler case of crystals, the, the statistical mechanism was widely open. So how, how do you expect to uh, even approach this problem? But now the, the, the thing is that here, if you, um, restrict ourselves to discrete tiles, so the wank, wank tiles, uh, we can somehow circumvent the crystallization problem, crystallization uh, issue, because tiles automatically form a, form a lattice structure. And then we just, we can just focus on whether this structure that you, the, the, the arrangement of tiles on the lattice will be non-periodic or not. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about ways that we can 
approach this problem. So maybe the simplest way to think about it is that, okay, so let's say I uh, have a tile set, but uh, I want to allow for errors. And just to simplify things, let's consider that the, the errors occur at random and independently of each other. Okay, and, and the, with, a, with a very small probability. So there's a very low frequency of errors and the errors are independent on different sides. And, uh, and, the, and the other sides where, where there's no error, the behavior is like, like, the, uh, like usual. Now the question is, will the overall structure survive if we have these random uh, um, errors, independent random errors? In other words, if we have a faulty, if we, uh, if you have a faulty tiling in this fashion, so the faults are independ occur independently, uh, will that tiling be close in some sense or another to a valid tiling? Now, uh, for most of these aperiodic tile sets, uh, so they, the way that people have designed them is that there the, the are certain intricate signal signalies that they encode signals between different tiles. And these signals somehow uh, enforce a hierarchical structure like the one in Amman's tiles. And that hierarchical structure um, would correspond to non periodicity and because of that, if, if you allow even the slightest amount of error, that those signals could be corrupted. And then as a result, they, they, they can ruin the entire non-periodic structure. So this is very non-trivial that we can have such a, uh, if we can have a tile set where faulty tilings are close to uh, valid tilings. But nevertheless, uh, Duran, Ramoshenko and Shen, they managed to construct in a periodic tile set, which is robust in the, or stable in, a, in this sense, in, the, in a particular sense. So in which sense? So they introduced a notion of sparseness and they said that, okay, so if I, the set of error, the set of positions where errors occur are sparse, then, uh, then there will be some valid tiling, which is close to that. Uh, faulty tiling. Okay. And then at the same time, they also showed that um, if you have independent, um, well, a Bernoulli process with a very low density, with high probability, you get some pattern which is, which is sparse. So that would imply that if you have independent low frequency errors, then you get some pattern, some, some tiling, some faulty tiling, which is close to uh, a valid tiling. Of course, I mean, the notion of closeness is not, not obvious. How, what does it mean for a faulty tiling, tiling to be close to a valid tiling? And uh, that's still something that to be explored, but for, for their example, uh, it means that the the errors, the, the, the deviations from the, the valid tilings are really localized and the, the rest percolates. The rest percolates and so the, the deviations have low density. Um, now this construction is really interesting for several reasons in, in the, and it's in fact a part of, so they uh, offered this construction as part of a larger, large paper that gave all kinds of interesting, uh, different, different constructions with very interesting properties. And the idea is that uh, they, they use uh, the idea of fixed points from compu computation theory. And uh, somehow they managed to, con well, they managed to find a very flexible way to find uh, tile sets that simulate themselves. And then at the same time, they had to uh, introduce some error correct correction mechanism inside this tile set to ensure that property of stability against uh, independent noise. 
Then there's a more recent work by uh, Leo and Matthias Abwick that they showed that even a variant of Robinson tiocid, Robinson tiocid is one of the first examples of uh, aperiodic tiocid, which is very widely studied and is quite simple. They showed that a variant of uh, that tiocid has some sort of stability already. Well, the, the original tiocid didn't have that stability, but they, if they modified it properly, they got something which uh, has some stability, particular uh, if the, the frequency of errors is very small, then, then the, uh, you can find invalid tiling uh, where the, the density of deviations is very small. The density of deviations between the valid tiling and the faulty tiling would be very small. And, and if, but also they provided very quantitative bounds uh, about the speed of convergence. And I hope that maybe Leo will later tell us about some of these things in his talk. Okay, uh, so these are the results about tilings with independent errors. But uh, so at low temperature, the ther thermal fluctuations are not independent. In fact, most of the time they, the, uh, the errors turn to uh, tend to cluster with each other. And uh, so instead of like independent or like a Bernoulli process, we have to think about a different way to model uh, random fluctuations at, at low temperature. And this is offered by equilibrium statistical mechanics. So the general framework to think about uh, what happens at low temperature. So, yeah, so according to equilibrium statistical mechanics, so at zero temperature, so again, think about the first example of crystals. At zero temperature, uh, the system tries to you know, achieve equilibrium in a state that minimizes the energy. And that, uh, yeah, so that those configurations that minimize the energy is what we call the ground configurations. And at a uh, positive temperature, on the other hand, the system takes its equilibrium at the state which minimizes, minimizes the free energy. The free energy is energy minus temperature times the entropy. And uh, there's some theory behind this. And then at the end, uh, you can show that this, the, the states that minimize the free energy, you can express them very appropriately by so-called Gibbs measures. Um, so these are set of probability measures on the set of all configurations of uh, the system. Okay. Now, so so what can how can we think about quasi crystals at positive uh, at zero and positive temperature in the language of uh, statistical mechanics. So let's take just an arbitrary aperiodic set of Lang tiles. And uh, now, so the interaction between the, uh, the, the tiles, I have to, again, I, I want to model it with an energy, with, a, with a, this would be the potential energy between two neighboring sites, neighboring tiles. And I, I'm going to use a very simple notion of energy. So whenever there's a tiling error, I associate energy plus one. And if there's no tiling error, then there's no energy zero. And uh, so, in, so in particular, if you do that, then the ground configurations are essentially valid tilings, except that there is a possibility that you will have infinite lines of defects. So there will be some valid tilings on the left and the left and then some valid tilings on the right. Um, okay, so here's, yeah, for example, okay, so if I have a tiling which is uh, not completely valid, it has errors, then there will be, okay, so for example, here there I have a, I have a tiling error. So this color does not match this. I'm assigning energy plus one. Here again, another 
tiling error. And here is another tiling error. In this configuration, has energy three. Okay. Now, yeah, so at, at uh, positive temperature, positive but low temperature, then uh, the question is whether the faulty tilings, the ones that, that come from, uh, that, that are explained by equilibrium statistical mechanics, whether they are most of the time almost surely close to valid tilings. And well, as you can imagine, they, 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 the answer is that most of the time, no. And, uh, but on the other hand, so this was very simple example and I just, I didn't do anything. So it can be, it's just possible that, or it's imaginable that if I use a proper type set and perhaps a more intricate notion of energy, notion, interaction energy between tiles, then, then you would get some uh, um, tilings which are stable. Uh, there is some, okay, maybe the, strong, <laughs> the strongest result that is available is a mountain, uh, like an um, experimental, not an experimental, numerical result. Uh, so the Monte Carlo simulations uh, that uh, Aristotle and Radian had, have done shows that uh, this particular tile set, this is one of the tile sets which was discovered by Richard and not, not, your, not the original tile set that I showed you, but a different tile set. Uh, so this particular tile set, it seems that it is stable at positive temperature. Yeah, so nice, very remarkable property of this tile set. For what? Some reason I have, I've rotated the tiles. Uh, so the remarkable property of this is that it, it has determinism in two directions. In particular, if I know the, the color of the two top triangles to two top edges, then the tile is uniquely determined. For example, there's only one tile which has light blue on the left and, and dark blue on the right. And likewise, it is also deterministic from below. So uh, given the, the colors at the bottom two edges, there's only one, well, there's at, at, at most one tile which has that property. Which, which, which is present here is, uh, well, there's at most one tile which has those prescribed uh, colors. Okay, so let me also mention some mathematical results, which are very incomplete. So there is uh, old construction by Van Amter, Munich, and Zaradnik which is not based on a periodic tile sets, but it has very similar ideas. Uh, so the, the interaction in their model is not local. So the interaction that I showed you was just that two neighboring sites have a positive energy and then other uh, tiles do not, tiles which are far from each other, they do not interact. Well, in their example, the, the interaction is infinite range, but exponentially decaying. So even the tiles which are, or positions which are very far each from each other, they interact. But the, the farther that they get, the interaction is weaker and weaker. And they, uh, yeah, so they showed that, so they constructed such a model and they showed that it has uh, some sort of quasi-crystal behavior at low temperature. In particular, uh, if you know about two M Morse sequence, so it uh, it enforces the two M Morse sequence along one of the three dimensions. So this is a three-dimensional model. So it enforces uh, two M Morse sequence, and uh, it, they use the other two dimensions just for repetition, just to stabilize this two M Morse sequence. So essentially, the ground configuration of this model is two M Morse sequence in one direction, and then along the, two, the other two dimensions we have repetition. So it's a very hardcore, uh, very um, inefficient error correction mechanism. <laughs> so 
So you repeat every symbol infinitely many times. Then there is another construction, which is even funnier that uh, it's four dimensional and it's based on uh, the Amon style, so there's 16 tiles that I showed you. So, but this is four dimensional. Again, it has the same property, same, same idea that it uses two of the two uh, extra dimensions. So in two dimensions, it enforces uh, Amon stylings and the, the other two directions is just repetition. And uh, so for this construction, this is very <laughs> unexpectedly, it is it's based on some connections with uh, cellular automata, the theory of cellular automata, and in particular fault tolerant computation. So this, I, the, question, the ideas of um, survival of um, the structure in the presence of random fluctuations is very closely related to the problem of how we can do computation if the components of the, uh, your computer are, are noisy. And there are some results about this fault tolerant computation in the setting of cellular automata that can be translated essentially or can be used along with Amon's style set to get this four dimensional model. Okay, um, but the, the general question is very wide open. So I think I want to uh, stop, but so let me just mention that this was this is just one facet of uh, of this the question of tilings into presence of errors. And uh, so one, so you. Let me just uh, do a bit of daydreaming. So if you have, let's say we, which somehow managed to solve this problem of quasi, uh, quasi crystals at positive temperatures. In particular, we, we find uh, uh, in a periodic tile set, which is stable at positive temperature. Then perhaps we can, we can use this to construct uh, tiles at, at another scale that behave that in that particular way and then use them to uh, construct structures. And so I say that this is daydreaming, but in fact, this has been studied. So, so there are some people who uh, do in, in the laboratory try to construct uh, rank tiles using uh, DNA, DNA and uh, and then they have, they have observed, so there, there are papers about it that you can see that, uh, but that they, these uh, tiles, they match each other and, and then they form some structure. But the main problem there is that they don't, these structures do not scale. That means that uh, very quickly they, you lose everything to random fluctuations. And, but you can imagine that if you have a theoretical model of a bank tile uh, uh, a periodic set of bank tiles, which is stable at, pos at positive temperature, then you, cost, you uh, make DNA copies of that, uh, those bank tiles, and then lower the temperature. So you, then you have a pool of those bank, DNA bank tiles, and then lower the temperature, and then they uh, arrange themselves into a valid tile, or almost valid tile. Um, Okay, like I said, there's also connection with fault tolerant comp computation and also some other concepts in, in computer science, the notion of self stabilization, which maybe I can stop this time. Thank you. Um, hi. hi, my name is Andre. I'm a grad student of physics. <laughs> I think I'm gonna yell. I think right. oh, this is making too much. Oh no, I think it's fine now. All right. All right, so <laughs> you mentioned, um, I think I'm gonna stop you out. Okay, so you mentioned 
equilibrium statistical mechanics as a starting point and then you started talking about uh, some of the faulty tilings and you stopped short of um, mentioning glassy states which are very much similar to these uh, faulty tilings and is that is that me pushing the analogy too much or is that a valid analogy in that case and would these systems be dynamic in a way where these faulty tilings can rearrange themselves after some period of time thus making the analogy full on spot on okay i didn't talk about that analogy because i don't know anything about glassy uh, states and yeah i guess there might be some connection and as for dynamics yeah of course at the end maybe you want to have some dynamics but even the equilibrium version is difficult enough for us <laughs> uh, to analyze. So, so the equilibrium statistical mechanics essentially you're, you're somehow getting rid of the dynamics and you just look at the equilibrium. So just to make it easier. Thank you, Samak. Uh, I just have a question about uh, like the identification of chaos. Are you, uh, or is it normally done through like a symbolic dynamic uh, approach to the tiling? So how do you actually characterize the chaotic behavior? Um, oh, oh, so that chaotic behavior is, uh, it's just a name for, for a particular phenomenon that, uh, I don't know, maybe it was known in physics before, but, um, at least uh, in the context that I am aware of, it's, it was discovered by Fanenter and Rogel. So they, they have this kind of um, lattice systems, finite range lattice systems, or well, not their example, but a different example that they performed. Finite range lattice system. And it has this property that if you lower the temperature, uh, so there, there will be a lot of fluctuations with the, with the Gibbs measures. And it, it, there will be more and more fluctuation in such a way that when the, the Gibbs measure will not converge. So I can imagine, uh, when I want to imagine it is like uh, some, let's say you have some um, material which you, when, when you lower the temperature, sometimes it turns blue and sometimes it turns red. And then it, when you lower and lower the temperature, it, turn, it uh, changes between blue and red faster and faster and it never converges, it never converges to either blue or, or red. I have a question. Yeah. So um, it seems that you can define a different type of energy from, I mean, even fixing the type of tilings, you can define different energy. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do people proceed here? I mean, they, how, how, what, how the research is, going in the data in the sense I mean just do you define the energy based on what on, on similarities with other kind of systems or well I mean this this uh, what was it yes this this is the simplest that you can imagine and uh, yeah essentially there is no general guideline um, for this example that um, so but for this example, I don't know because it, it's not even based on uh, a periodic tile set. But for this example, that energy comes from the connection with probabilistic solar automata. And that comes very naturally. So it turns out that there is a connection between, so if you have a probabilistic solar automaton, then the space-time diagram of that probabilistic solar automaton has a Gibbs distribution. And, uh, and that the, the energy that corresponds to that Gibbs distribution comes directly from the um, law of that probabilistic solar automaton. If there are no other questions, let's thank uh, again. Thank you. Thank you.